Hi, welcome to the Hungarian Living Podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Sabo Voss. Our goal is to discover, celebrate, and share Hungarian heritage and encourage you to do it too. We'll touch on food, travel, history, music, and language, and share stories from our listeners. We're glad you're here. This is a podcast where we'll encourage you to dig deeper to learn about your Hungarian heritage in a variety of ways. We'll have thought-provoking conversations and share resources. So whether you know a little or a lot about being Hungarian, this is the place to be. Welcome to another episode of Hungarian Living. For the month of October, the Hungarian Living podcast is going to focus on the Hungarian Revolution of 1956 in a variety of ways. This special series will discuss the revolution and its impact on families, ways to involve children in a deeper understanding of the events that took place during that time, how memories are and can be preserved, and the impact it has had on the Hungarian-American communities around the USA. During this series, I will be talking with my friend, Andrea Laura Rice. She has a unique perspective about 1956 and has developed and worked on a variety of projects that are gifts to our community as we seek to better understand the events and those we love whose lives were changed because of that time. Welcome to the podcast, Andrea. Well, thank you, Liz. It's my first ever podcast, so I'm very excited to be here. And as you know, I've been a longtime fan of all of your work with Magyar Marketing and now with the Magyar Living Podcast. So I am very, very honored to be here. Well, great. And Andrea, can you give just a brief recap of the events of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution in Budapest, Hungary? Well, sure. There are, of course, many more qualified historians who could give you a much better understanding of this. But um, I have been researching this topic for a couple of decades, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of paint in a, uh, in a cliff note version, if you will. So on the revolution started on October 23rd in 1956, and the exciting part of the revolution is really that it was uh, started by the young people in Hungary. It was started in, uh, on a college campus, and it was immediately kind of adopted as a, um, as a young person's revolution, although everyone across the, the nation participated. And it really showed for the first time that the Hungarians were interested in overthrowing communism that had been forced upon them by the Soviet Union. And it was the first time that there had been this kind of a grassroots uprising that was uh, seen as very threatening in the Soviet Union. So on October 23rd, the revolution started. It was a planned protest where the students were going to march and they were going to present their demands to the local Hungarian government. And one of the demands, of course, was that the Russians would leave Hungary and stop their occupation. And during the course of the day, while these events were being planned, more and more people started to hear and they gathered on the streets. And so it became this real groundswell and, uh, and it ended up in front of the parliament. It also ended up in front of the Hungarian radio station, which is where the first shots were fired and where it turned from a peaceful demonstration into a, an armed revolution. And at that point, pretty amazing thing happened. Some of the uh, Hungarian guards gave their weapons to the young Hungarian freedom fighters, and and then they became it became an armed revolution. So for around two weeks, about two weeks, the Hungarian nation rose up and kind of shook off the yoke of of communist uh, Soviet Union, of communist rule, and they started uh, a democratic society in all of the ways where it mattered. It was a it was a um, a way for them to determine who they wanted as their governmental representatives. It was a way for them to create free spe- free press, free speech. They were able to gather. They were able to go to church, all things that were forbidden under communism. And we can go into the details of all of this. This is probably a lengthier, lengthier description than you may have wanted. So sorry. Uh, <laughs> but then November 4th, the Soviet Union decided that this was probably uh, more dangerous than they originally anticipated. And they came back in to Hungary and crushed the revolution with very decisive force and reestablished their dominance. So once the revolution had been crushed on November 4th, um, more than 200,000 uh, Hungarians ended up crossing the border, 
choosing to leave their lives behind them in Hungary, their homeland behind them, and they uh, escaped across the border. And 35,000 of those Hungarians ended up coming to the United States. And it's always kind of widely talked about that this group who was usually who were actively involved in the revolution in some in some way, once they escaped or once they were forced to flee, fearing repercussions, they came to whatever their new homeland was, in this case, the United States, and they were an incredibly impassioned, uh, incredibly inspired group who who started new organizations and who passed on their heritage with great passion to the next generation and made sure that the spirit of the Hungarian Revolution was never forgotten. And we certainly saw that in the United States. So let's talk now about your family's connection, because your mom was a part of that action. She's one of those people that came over mm-hmm. during that time. She did. So my mom, Edith Lauer, was 14 at the time of the revolution. And she and my aunt, Nora Subble, who was 16, they lived on Morizigmon Square, which is kind of one of the transportation hubs, I would say, on the Buddha side, where, you know, the seven hills of Buddha and then Pest is more the industrial area. So they were on uh, Morizigmon. And that's that's very close to Gellert, uh, the Gellert Hotel, for, for people that may know that. This was kind of a, a transportation hub where a lot of buses and trams, the Vila Moshes, would, would come in. My grandfather worked at the um, Hungarian National Bank, but once the revolution broke out, he actually, uh, he said, he tipped his hat to his colleagues and he walked home and he never returned. He was, he was part of the revolutionary committee there, but his primary role from that point on was d- helping dig up the cobblestones from the streets to make the barricades. My grandmother actually had a very active role. She worked in the pharmacy, which was conveniently right downstairs and, and just around the corner from uh, from the apartment that they lived in. And actually, it's still there to this day, the patika or the pharmacy on Murishigwan Square. And, um, and because public transportation stopped in 1956 when the revolution happened, in fact, you can probably see lots of pictures of kind of burned Vila Moshes and trams that have been overturned. There was no transportation, no way for anyone else in the pharmacy to get to work. So my grandmother ended up being the only person uh, hmm. in the pharmacy. And, you know, by by the middle of it, the windows were all blown out. And I mean, there was all sorts of um, activity that happened around Morishigmon Square. Uh, and she told us stories, you know, our entire lives growing up about some of the things she witnessed uh, through her the blown out windows of the pharmacy. But she also helped care for wounded freedom fighters because, of course, they couldn't go to the hospital. Uh, They would be arrested or killed. And uh, and so she actually had kind of a makeshift um, ER, I guess we could call it, in the back of the Mm -hmm. pharmacy. And there was also a supply of alcohol in the basement um, that... um, my aunt may or may not have used on occasion to help um, help some of her fellow classmates fill up bottles that may or may not have been used as small tough cocktails. Um, so there was, you know, there was quite a quite a bit of um, I mean, it was kind of periphery on the periphery, but but there was definitely activity from my aunt Nora and my and my mom, who was fourteen, was certainly uh, front and center for for a lot of this activity. My he then he was just a friend of the family, but he later became my uncle, Karo Ibachi. He had a camera and was a and was a photog- a budding photographer, and he was known to break curfew on a few occasions to take pictures of some of what was happening during the revolution. We were actually able to print to to see his um, the pictures that he took uh, later on, which was another way to help commemorate his role and and the role of the freedom fighters. So I kind of grew up hearing these stories. So you've had a front row seat into the impact that this has had in your mom and your aunt's life and and their perspective as they were involved from their home location, but also they were involved in other ways as well. Yeah, they, they were. My mom in particular I remember she went to the parliament on the evening of October 23rd and she um she was 14 so she was small it's it's actually amazing to think you know I have a 12 year old son right now and a 17 year old son so <laughs> she was right in between the two of them and 
you know, witnessing this this uh, unbelievable, I think, unimaginable in many ways, um, revolution right in front of her with people that she knew and people that she loved. So she actually crawled up. She said she couldn't, she didn't have a very good view and she was a little frustrated. So she crawled up on the side of the parliament steps with, I don't know if you know where the two great lions are. Well, of course, you know, Liz, but I'm hoping our our uh, our listeners will know, uh, or or you will check. But on the back side of the parliament, there are two huge lions that kind of adorn the sides of the steps where you go up into the very ceremonial entrance. And my mother climbed up the side of one of those lions, and uh, but then, <laughs> but then she was so exhausted she could barely get down, and she was so little she could barely get down, so she had to kind of come down. And at that point, all of her friends had moved on. And so she ended up having to walk back to to the apartment much after her curfew. And and she said she was really, you know, petrified that she was going to get a, a good talking to by by uh, my Najmami and Najapi, her parents. But uh, they, she said they were huddled by the, the radio, um, listening to the news through Radio Free Europe. And and so they barely, <laughs> they barely scolded her at all when she walked in the door. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. And then, of course, that's the, those are the stories of the revolution, but probably the more impactful part came when they made the decision to escape. And, and I think that's the part, I, that's the part that's so amazing to me to think about, to try to put myself in, in their position, making, making a decision like that. Uh, at the end of the day, I think it came down to that they wanted a better life for my mother and my aunts, that they wanted to give them every opportunity. And they knew that that was not going to happen if they stayed in Hungary. And so they made the incredibly difficult decision to to escape. They escaped in two different waves. My my grandfather, my mother, and, and two friends left in the first wave. And that was a little bit of an easier escape. They kind of hid on the, on the bottom of a car and went across the border when it wasn't terribly, I mean, it was strict, but they, they could kind of make their way. My aunt and my grandmother had a much more difficult escape. The story as they tell it is that they went to the uh, train station and it was so packed that they literally, she had to kind of bribe somebody, to, two people at the same time to pick them up from the outside of the train and give them to passengers who could bring them inside the window. And then they, at the same time, because they were terrified of being separated and then they had to come down inside the train and there was really no room for it to happen. So they kind of had to, you know, um, kind of crawl their way up. Then they went through to the border. They were warned ahead of time that there were Russian soldiers at the border because they knew so many people were escaping. So they actually leapt from the moving train before it got to a particular station. Wow. Then they had to bribe their way to to stay at a, at a farmer's house. Then they had to do the same to get kind of in a wagon covered up with hay on its way to the border. You know, so these unbelievable images that you can just imagine, you know, listening to the story and hearing it. It's, I mean, it's just out of a Hollywood movie. No one could think that this could happen today. And of course, it didn't happen today. But 64 years ago, that sounds like a long time ago, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not, not that, that long ago. <laughs> it's not that long ago. No, it's not that long ago. Uh, so they they made it to the border. There are you know stories of the of the swooping searchlights, the Russian guards on the border, trying to find people who were trying to escape. They had to kind of sludge through this. I don't know. They called it kind of like quicksandy material to get across, and then they were finally in Austria, and they were welcomed uh, by a group. I think it was the um, International Rescue Committee. On on the other side, they were given hot chocolate and told to wait on the side of the road. And they were waiting, wondering how they could get in, in touch with my grandfather and my mother, who were in Vienna and had been there for, for a couple of weeks. And, uh, and just at that moment, back came my uncle and a search party that they had created to go back into Hungary oh, wow. to get them. And, uh, and my grandmother always says, and this always, I mean, to this day, it still gives me a chill. She says, if you don't believe in God now, 
here is the story. So as they're sitting on the side of the road waiting for a gentleman who is going to take them to Vienna, unload his supplies, this search party comes down the street, recognizes my grandmother from the picture on the side of my grandfather's bed where he's staying in Vienna, which was a miracle unto itself because my grandmother uh, had problems with her heart. And so all of this, uh, you know, crossing the border and wading through this quicksand material and you know, hiding underneath the hay in a in a truck was not very good for her heart. So she was quite disheveled, sure. I would imagine, at that point. And and uh, and but he recognized her from this picture, and he said, "I I know where your where your husband is." I, I'll so take it wasn't even him. somebody she knew; it was somebody that had only mm-hmm. seen a picture of her and happened by at that exact moment and found. Wow! Yeah, yeah. What an incredible story! So pretty yeah. incredible. Well, and I think you know. There are, that's one of the things I think that has so uh, fascinated me about 1956 for so long, that there are so many incredible stories like this and so many moments where it just, you know, you, you catch your breath thinking of it. You think oh, that, well, that can't right. be true. That how, how could that have happened? And, uh, and it's such a, it's unfortunately, it's such a, it's not a very well-known story outside of the Hungarian community. And that's one of the reasons I've done so many projects right. <laughs> in an attempt to capture people's stories so that it, this can be shared because it, it really is, I mean, just filled with iconic moments like that and incredible ways that people banded together to beat the odds. I mean, talk about a modern day David versus Goliath story. It, it's just, it's just incredible. Yeah. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about the concept of the freedom fighters and you know, who is a freedom fighter? Who was a freedom fighter? And what what did that entail? So the first project that I did to try to help answer that question was something called freedomfighter56.com. It was an oral history website. And we originally created it as a way to gather people's stories just prior to the 50th anniversary. But I was also doing some outreach programs for kids. I I did a graphic novel and a computer game that I know we're going to talk about on the next segment. So I don't want to get too much into that. But the oral history website actually kind of took on a life of its own. And we have, I think, over 100 written testimonials from people sharing their stories in a variety of different ways, from poetry to, to pictures to short stories to just kind of their, their own recollections. And one of my favorites from there, from the website is Tibor Sharkadi, who I actually met in Budapest with his entire family because they were so proud and so connected to the story of 56. And he wrote something that called Who Was a Freedom Fighter? And I, I read this at a lot of commemorations because I think it's a it's just a great way to think about it. When you think of a freedom fighter, oftentimes you'll, you'll think about somebody who's armed, who has a weapon, and who's actually actively taking part in the fighting. But, but he elaborates on this a little bit. He says, who was a freedom fighter? Yes, I was, with a weapon in my hand. And for this, by the way, he was sentenced to death in 1957. But he goes on to say, but so was that Hungarian policeman who was directing traffic three blocks from the radio station where we were killed by the hundreds on the night of October 23rd when I had nothing to fight with. I went to him with tears in my eyes and said, what are you doing? Don't you know we're being slaughtered and here you are with a weapon by your side? What kind of a Hungarian are you? He told me he was married with two children and couldn't risk being part of the fighting. So I told him, if you're not going to use your gun, then give it to me. He looked me in the eyes and said, here it is, my son and handed me his weapon. He was a freedom fighter. But so was the old lady who gave me a cup of hot chocolate to keep me warm. She was a freedom fighter. Or the gentleman who told me, boys, don't go that way. There are Russians coming. He was a freedom fighter. Or my friend and schoolmate who died in my place just by virtue of the fact that we had changed places operating a machine gun just 10 seconds earlier. He was a freedom fighter or the Hungarian tank commander and his crew who refused to kill us on the night of October 23rd and paid with their lives for disobeying a direct order. They were all freedom fighters. And his story goes on. Uh, There's just a number of vivid, beautiful moments that he talks about and that I think shows us and reminds us that, you know, it wasn't just the, the folks who took up arms, but it really was an entire nation and a grassroots movement 
it wasn't just the young people. It was the old people. It was the workers. It was the students. It was the folks who were retired. It was the politicians. It was everyone. So um, again, a beautiful way to uh, to think about that and to and to remember that. I've got one more, if if you would indulge me. Imre Farkas is also uh, one of my favorite stories, and his wonderful wife Lily. Both of them are included in Fifty Six Stories. And just by way of quick background, Imre was imprisoned as a political prisoner, as somebody who didn't fit the right narrative. He wasn't a, a good communist rule follower. So he was at, in the Vats prison trying to get home and get back to Lily. So he's explaining the prison break. And he said, we were unsure how the armed secret police troops would act who guarded the prison from outside, but we took the risk. And he's talking about the prisoners. He said, we started toward the Iron Gates and with the help of some friendly non-AVO, AVO is a secret service, non-AVO guards, we broke open the last Iron Gate. Outside the gate, several thousand people, Vats residents, were waiting for us, crying and embracing us. The people in whose name we were supposedly sentenced were welcoming us. We sang the national anthem together. Suddenly in this emotional moment, Shots of automatic weapons rang out. The crowd tried to disperse quickly, but some fell, already dead or wounded. The AVO men were shooting at us from the roof of the prison building. We ran as fast as we could, still in our prison uniforms. As we ran through the streets, through the backyards, over fences, people started throwing civilian clothes to us. An old man gave me his only top coat. Children brought their parents' jackets. One of the most poignant scenes was when a little boy about eight years old ran to me and said, I can't give you anything else, but please take my comb. You might need it. In a few days on October 30th, I arrived to Budapest and after five and a half years of confinement was finally reunited with my wife. Mm. Wow. Sadly, neither of those wonderful gentlemen are still with us. Imre passed away several years ago and Tibor just passed away. It's, I I believe it's three years now. So even more precious to have their stories, their remembrances written down and, and available for us to hear. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one, you know, I have to thank you for this opportunity to, to talk about this because as I said, 56 is such a special topic to me, but it's allowed me to kind of revisit some of these projects. It's been a little while. We did most of these for the 50th anniversary, which is uh, 14 years ago now. But this morning, in preparation for our talk, I reread my mother's essay in the book. So we ended up, the oral history website was such a big hit, and we we got so many incredible stories that we ended up publishing not just one book, but two books, one in Hungarian, one in English. And then several pro- other projects came from there. But the one of the things I'm proudest of is not only did we collect the stories, but we also created a space for spouses and children of mm-hmm. 56ers to reflect on the legacy. And and I think that's that was unique then. And, you know, as we get further and further from the actual revolution, of course, time marches on. And, and soon, uh, I hope not not too soon, but soon enough, we'll lose our, our freedom fighters and, and we won't have a way to hear them tell their stories to us. So we really need to need to jump on the moment. If you still have an opportunity to interview your dad, you know, your, your grandmother, uh, your aunt, your uncle, whoever, you know, I really encourage you to do so. If you would indulge me just one more time, I, I wanted to read the last paragraph that my mother wrote in her essay. And this, uh, she entitled it 1956 when the impossible seemed possible. And this last segment is called, what does it all mean to me? And to me, this really is quite poignant and, and kind of sums it up. She writes, it took me many years to realize what a significant life defining experience the 1956 revolution was for me. The ideals, the courage, the sacrifice Hungarians willingly made then to gain their freedom began a process that continued in Poland, then Prague, and culminated only in 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall. But it must be remembered that nearly 50 years ago, it was those young Hungarian freedom fighters who first gave the ultimate sacrifice to show the world the true and terrible face of communism. 
Many of the 200,000 Hungarians who left their homeland for the West felt responsible for keeping the flame of freedom alive until Hungary again became free. The privilege of living through those unforgettable days has inspired a deep commitment on our part to pass on to our children what love of freedom meant then in 1956 and what we must do today to make sure that all Hungarians, including members of the historical Hungarian communities in the Carpathian Basin, have the freedom to live free, productive, and satisfying lives. And that, that to me kind of sums up the spirit, not just the spirit of the revolution and our, I think, obligation, mm -hmm. honestly, in some ways to keep that spirit alive, to keep the stories alive, but also to understand how it affected and impacted the Hungarians who left and who came to the United States in our case, but 200,000 yeah. left. And in many cases, it was, you know, some of some of the, the the great, you know, the best of the best. It was the people who were really involved in the movement. And and so many people stayed and were impacted in different right. ways because right. they stayed. Whether you stayed or whether you left, you were going to live with something from that, you know. Absolutely. And, and scattered really all over the world. So there's these bits and pieces of people with that impact that are carrying on, passing on, passing it on, you know, sharing with their families and, and the people around them, their stories and, or, or hopefully doing that. And, and I think that that's part of what your work does is encourage people to share their stories and we'll, we'll make sure that we have links in the show notes to where those questions are so that people can ask those questions within their families links to where the stories are so that people can read the stories. You know, sometimes uh, people don't, don't volunteer their story, but when they hear another story, it gets them to think about it. You know, it's, it's, this is hard stuff to talk about. And right. a lot of times it's just been buried for many years and not discussed either for the pain that it brings or because of, you know, this fear, fear of retribution. Even though I think, you know, some people have gotten past that concept already that, you know, there isn't necessarily a price on their head. But when you live like that for a long time, you just figure, well, why bring it up now? Let's not discuss it. Mm -hmm. I'm safer this way if we don't discuss it. So. so for a time, you lived in Budapest and you were there for some of the first free commemorations I was, yeah. I I moved to Budapest in in 1990. Just graduated from from school with a degree in journalism, and I I thought, good lord, there's no greater story that will likely happen in my lifetime than the fall of the Berlin Wall and the and the tearing down of the Iron Curtain. Why am I sitting in Cleveland, Ohio? So I I decided to <laughs> to move to Budapest and. And it was it was incredible. That October was the I think the second free commemoration of 1956, and I remember quite vividly going in front of the parliament, and there was a huge revolutionary flag, and and that's the red, white, and green fl uh, typical flag of of, the, of Hungary. But um, the symbol for the revolution, if some of you don't know, is the large hole in the middle, because of course in 1956. There was the hammer and sickle of the Soviet Union, and and that was that they were the oppressor. And so one of the iconic images of the revolution became people tearing out that hammer and sickle from the middle of the flag. So there was a huge flag with a hole cut out of the middle draped over the steps of the parliament, and there were candles all across the steps. And I remember standing there, and on one of the bottom steps, there was a an older gentleman, and he he was sitting on the steps with tears rolling down his down his face, but his uh, young grandson was in his lap, and he was talking about the revolution and about what happened during that time, and it was it was uh, just such a, a, a vivid memory for me and such a, an emotional moment. Uh, for that family, and I think for so many others, and and for years, actually, after I started researching fifty six and trying to research more about my family's history, I actually 
use the um, Hungarian National Museum archives and I found a picture of cobblestone barricades that my family helped direct on Morishigwan wow. Square. And uh, I found a picture of the, of the pharmacy. So when I was doing research around that, I still found things that were crossed out and it was sometimes labeled as the counter revolution. So it was, of course, I mean, you understand why Hungarians weren't allowed to to celebrate this or commemorate this because it was seen as being anti-government and counter-revolutionary. So, um, so I always thought that was so, that was so interesting and uh, seeing those first free mm-hmm commemorations and celebrations were were really pretty incredible pretty inspirational and i'll i'll just um you know wrap up my my thought on that on that moment i i always had this interesting debate with my mom about is it a commemoration or is it a celebration and um and i always said whenever i did something and i started i think for the 40th anniversary was the first time maybe the 35th i um i was able to do a multimedia exhibit on the revolution of 1956. And I, I called it the, the commemoration and celebration. And my mother immediately took issue with that. And she said, it's not a celebration. You know, people lost their lives and people's lives were completely upended and changed. And I said, well, I, I understand that. And I respect that. And I, you know, you're, you're the freedom fighter. You're the 56 right. or not me. But the reason that I consider it to be a celebration is I don't think at any time in history have Hungarians been, you know, more (laughs) popular is a strange choice of word. But I mean, that is that's the moment, right? The freedom fighters, the 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 modern day David and David versus Goliath, the ones who brought the Soviet, the mighty Soviet Union to its knees when no one mm-hmm. else dared, when no one else was able to, not even the United States. And so Hungarian freedom fighters and people who came to the U.S., for example, we hear this story all the time. I mean, they were given pretty incredible opportunities not all of them, but but a you know, but a good handful of them, and they were mm-hmm. welcomed into churches and into communities, and they were um, often celebrated. So, I thought, you know, okay, yes, on the one hand, we're absolutely commemorating all that right. was lost, but we can also celebrate this this bright moment in Hungarian history, which, for anyone who studied Hungarian history, it is it's a, a bit of a sad journey. There have not been a lot of military victories, for example. Right. So this is a moment to to really celebrate that it was, you know, the spirit of the Hungarian freedom fighter. It was the young people of the country that that really longed for change and and valued freedom so much that they they took this incredible risk and made these incredible sacrifices. So I disagreed with mom on that point. And ever since that, then I have referred to this as a commemoration and celebration. I think she understands mm-hmm. that and, and she's okay with it because she knows how much I respect and really want to pay homage to, to the Hungarians, to the freedom fighters for the incredible, incredible bravery and courage that they, that they showed. Well, and especially if you look at it in light of the perspective of finally not being under Soviet control. You know, it some things some things get started, and it that the end wasn't on November fourth. You know, it wasn't that wasn't right. the end of it. But you, if you were in the middle of it, you didn't know that there was more to come. And sure. and as other people in other countries decided to, you know, pull it together and make their statements, and you know, then ultimately, then they were out of Soviet control. Right, absolutely. But the la- as you, I think, very rightly stated, there was a a lasting impact for anybody who who went through it, and uh, and we still talk about it with relatives back in Hungary mm-hmm. when we go. We still talk about it with my mother here. I know we'll get into this uh, a couple weeks from now, but we also I also launched another project with my dear friend Reka Pigniski called Memory Project, where we continued this work and and actually did created a visual history archive and you know that's that's constantly discussed by by the people there that that moment where they stepped across the border where they fled their homeland where they left their family behind i mean the the 
you know, the, the implicate, the lifelong yep. implications of the decisions that they were forced to make oftentimes at a very, very young age. Definitely. Really are, um, yeah, are amazing to consider. Um, there's one more, one more quote I wanted to share with you from our book. And it's from, it's from a, a dear wise man, Laszlo Dobosz, who was, uh, a Hungarian writer and, and also a, a politician in Slovakia. And it's, I think it's so interesting because he's coming to this from, from the position of living in, in the Hungarian region of Slovakia, looking at 56 and then looking at the Hungarian American community. So it's, a, it's kind of two, two steps removed in a, in a way. And he, he saw quite a bit about the, what he called the 56th generation in the United States. So he, what he describes, I think is, is quite uh, interesting. He says, this generation took with it a hate and fear of dictatorship and violence, a deep sense of patriotism, the acceptance of responsibility for its homeland and an abiding desire for freedom. Even at great geographical distance, it paid close attention to the fate of its homeland. It helped the opposition forces organize. Its members became acting diplomats who were appointed on moral grounds. This generation of Hungarian 56ers in America, with its behavior, institutions, and intellectual values, represents the outstanding achievement of our modern-day Hungarian history. Wow. So that does really sum it up, the, the intensity and the passion that we see here, particularly in Hungarian communities, but I think... Other people may not be in a Hungarian community, but they do see it in within their homes too, as the heritage is shared and passed on. Absolutely. And I would just say, I, I'm thrilled that uh, everyone's listening to Liz and I talk about this, but please look up the Hungarian Revolution of 1956 and try to uh, read the writings from the freedom fighters or listen to them tell the stories in their own words. It's uh, it's an incredible story that yes. should be shared. And what, so again, we'll have information for all the links and direct you into those places and make reading suggestions in the show notes that you'll find at hungarianliving.com. And we will continue our discussion in the upcoming weeks. And thank you, Andrea, for sharing so many important stories with us today. I look forward to continuing our discussion in the coming days. Me too, Liz. Thanks again for this great opportunity. Hungarian Living is a division of Mudyar Marketing, the Hungarian store, where you can find meaningful gifts with Hungarian style. Check us out at mudyarmarketing.com. And special thanks to Stephen Chichek and the Animal Cannibals for the show music. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Hungarian Living, please subscribe and share this podcast with your favorite Hungarian. Check out our show notes for links to resources mentioned in this episode. If you have a question or comment, email us at podcast at hungarianliving.com. We'll catch you next time.